Hello and welcome to the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation 2021 Virtual Annual Legislative Conference. We are so pleased and honored that you are joining us for a powerful week of programming, dialogue, networking, and fellowship. My name is Tanya Vesey, President and CEO of the Congressional Foundation, Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. While we are all, while we all hoped to be able to gather in person this year, we demonstrated in 2020 that there is power in these virtual spaces as well. The theme for this year's conference is Black Excellence Unparalleled, Pressing Onward in Power. Pressing Onward pressing onward despite the obstacles put in our way, pressing onward despite those who would like to take us back, pressing onward into a future that uplifts, empowers, and mobilizes Black communities across the country and the world. 2021 is a milestone year for the Congressional Black Caucus, and therefore for the country. This year marks the 50th anniversary of the caucus, and we will take time this week to pay tribute to those pioneering and courageous members who laid the foundation that we built upon today. This year also marks the 50th annual legislative conference and we will celebrate our strengths this year. This year's caucus class is the largest ever and a former CBC member serves as the first black and first female vice president of the United States in history. For 45 years, the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation has been a part of the journey working to create a world in which all communities have an equal voice in public policy through leadership cultivation, economic empowerment, and civic engagement. To realize that vision, we carry out our mission of advancing the global Black community by developing leaders and forming policy and educating the public. As you engage throughout the week, please be sure to use hashtag ALC50 on social media and tune in to BET for our signature events to close the week for hashtag Foundation Friday. So again, welcome. 
Welcome to the premier policy conference on issues that face our community. Welcome to ALC 50. I now present Gina Adams, FedEx Senior Vice President for Government and Regulatory Affairs. Gina. Thank you, Tanya. I'm honored to join you today on behalf of FedEx and our more than 570,000 employees who help deliver millions of packages daily in more than 220 countries and territories worldwide. As some of you may know, these individuals include 71,000 men and women who live and work in communities represented by members of the Congressional Black Caucus. And as we continue to grow and diversify our workforce, rest assured that number is increasing daily. We expect to add thousands of new jobs as we prepare for what will be another busy peak shipping season. And none of this would be possible without the tireless efforts and commitment of our multi-ethnic and multi-racial team and the small businesses that are an important part of the FedEx supply chain. In FY 2020, FedEx reported $1.6 billion in supplier spending with minority owned businesses. About 30% of that was with African-American owned businesses, and we look to increase that percentage yearly. As we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Congressional Black Caucus and its largest class ever, I want to especially thank CBC Chair and Congresswoman Joyce Beatty, today's esteemed Congressional panel, and all CBC members past and present who have been unwavering in their pursuit of justice, equality, and economic empowerment for communities of color across America. FedEx is proud to once again sponsor the annual legislative conference and celebrate the impactful work of the foundation. The continued leadership and efforts of the Congressional Black Caucus are more important than ever in these challenging times as we all work to lift and empower Black communities so all can enjoy this country's blessings. Thank you all for your continuing support and your participation today. And allow me to introduce Lori George Billingsley, Chair of the Foundation's Board of Directors. Thank you so much, Gina. Hello, and on behalf of the Board of Directors of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, welcome to the 50th Annual Legislative Conference. My name is Lori George Billingsley, and I have the honor of serving as chair of the CBCF Board. Our board is made up of dozens of leaders from government, business, and academia, all of us committed to helping the foundation carry out its mission of advancing the global black community. I'm particularly grateful to be able to serve as chair during this milestone year, as all of us reflect on the 50 year history of the Congressional Black Caucus, celebrate its role as the conscience of the Congress and look to the future with resolve, passion and purpose. In addition to welcoming you all to this year's event, I wanna also take a moment to thank our generous sponsors who have made it possible. Thank you to FedEx for sponsoring this opening session. I also wanna thank and recognize the 2021 ALC title sponsors, Amazon, Facebook, Toyota, Procter & Gamble, and I'm especially pleased to say the Coca-Cola company. We are so proud of the work that CBCF does every day through the Leadership Institute facilitating fellowships and internships, and through the awarding of scholarships, the foundation shapes the next generation and prepares them for lives and careers of service. Through research and policy analysis, the CBCF identifies ways that policy at all levels of government impacts the Black community 
and offers innovative solutions that advance the common good. And through events like the ALC, partnerships and other outreach opportunities, we educate the wider community about the issues affecting each and every one of us. It's exciting and important work, and we're glad you've chosen to be a part of it. Next, I have the distinct privilege of introducing the dynamic chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, Congresswoman Joyce Beatty. Lori, and good morning. Welcome to the 2021 Annual Legislative Conference. I am Congresswoman Joyce Beatty of the great state of Ohio, and I have the honor of serving as chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. This morning, I join my colleagues in welcoming you to this year's ALC, and I am very excited about what is in store. 2021 marks an extraordinary milestone for the CBC, a half century of service. For 50 years, the Congressional Black Caucus has fought for and on behalf of Black people and the communities we serve. We have been and will continue to be the conscience of the Congress. During this year's ALC, we will pay tribute to the 12 strong brothers and yes, one phenomenal sister who fought and who fought and founded the Congressional Black Caucus. And we will remind ourselves in the world of the powerful history that shapes our legacy and lights the way to our collective future. We will celebrate who we are today with our largest ever membership of 57 members. And we will recommit ourselves to the hard work we still need to accomplish. As I said at a caucus event, just as freedom fighters took the dark roads in the dead of the night to call for an end to racism, for the fight and the right to vote, we will continue to stand committed to the work ahead of us. That work includes an ambitious and proactive legislative agenda. We will address the racial wealth gap that leaves too many black communities behind. And we are addressing police reform and accountability. We are strengthening our education system to ensure it serves all of our communities and protecting and strengthening voting rights in America. Because make no mistake, those rights are still currently under assault. We must continue to press onward in power for systemic change. For the next several days, my colleagues and I, joined by some of the leading voices of our time, will discuss these and other issues with you as we chart our course for the future. Our power, our message, will convey throughout this action-packed week. And now, we will hear from my CBC colleague and the 2021 Honorary ALC Co-Chair, President Joe Biden's Congresswoman, and my friend, Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester of Delaware. She and her co-chair, Congressman Anthony Brown of Maryland, have served with honor and distinction. And this year, we, the CBC, could not be more proud. Thank you and welcome to the 50th Annual Legislative Conference. Well, thank you, Madam Chairwoman, not only for that introduction, but for your fierce and strong and powerful leadership of the Congressional Black Caucus. You also are my good friend and I am proud to serve with you. And hello everyone. I am Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester of Delaware. And along with my colleague, Anthony Brown, Congressman Anthony Brown, I am elated to serve as honorary co-chair of the 50th Annual Legislative Conference. Our theme this year, Black Excellence Unparalleled, pressing onward in power is like the CBC itself, strong, forward-looking, and ambitious. Our conference programming reflects our charge for 2021 and beyond as we continue to seek out ways to uplift, mobilize, 
and empower Black communities. As we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the founding of the CBC, we will take time to honor those on whose shoulders we stand today, the women and men who came together in 1971 with a recognition that there is strength in numbers. I'm proud to be in that number, 57 members strong, the largest CBC to date. For 50 years, the CBC has been at the forefront of so many critical issues, from racial, economic, and environmental justice to voting rights, healthcare, education, foreign policy, and more. We will also talk about the ongoing work of the CBC and our legislative goals for the months and years ahead. Each day of programming will begin at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time with a CBCF-sponsored session on topics such as financial wellness, transportation equity, health and wellness, the Foundation's National Racial Equity Initiative for Social Justice, and a Friday session focused on emerging leaders. During the day, dozens of CBC members will lead hour-long sessions on a range of issues that align with their expertise and work in Congress. There is so much to choose from, and I can't wait to dig in. Be sure to explore the conference lineup and don't forget to build your customized schedule for the week. Thank you for joining us this year. We are delighted that you're here. And I now get to pass the virtual microphone to my friend and fellow honorary co-chair, Congressman Anthony Brown. Hello, I'm Congressman Anthony Brown of Maryland and I can't tell you how honored I am to join my colleague and my sister in service Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester as an honorary co-chair of this year's CBCF virtual 50th ALC. We have an amazing week of program in store and we're so pleased that you're with us. The Congressional Black Caucus has served as a conscience of the Congress for 50 years, a legacy that we'll rightly celebrate this week. But as we all know, this is not the time to declare the job done. We still have a great deal of work ahead of us. 2020 was a year that left an indelible impact on the global black community. And 2021 has been a year to both look back upon lessons learned and look forward to the world we want to help create. We can't change the past, but we can and we must shape the future. The CBC has a bold legislative agenda from police reform to voting rights, economic justice, and recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic with equity and fairness. We'll talk about all of those and many other issues this week at the ALC, and we're eager to hear your perspectives as well. In addition to the sessions focused on key policy issues, our days this week will conclude with a variety of other programming, including a virtual fundraiser to support the CBCF Leadership Institute, professional development opportunities, and other special events. On Friday the 17th, the conference will conclude with hashtag Foundation Friday. The National Town Hall and the Phoenix Awards will be broadcast on BET and BET Her beginning at 7 p.m. Eastern time. And I invite you to join our finale, the virtual Black Party on Facebook Live with DJ Cassidy immediately following the Phoenix Awards. So mark your calendars now for all of these exciting, informative, and uplifting events. For now, let's get started. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the 50th Annual Legislative Conference. Thank you, Congressman. Good morning, everyone. I am Tori Williams, Vice President of Marketing and Communications for the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, and I'm excited to facilitate this event's question and answer segment. For the remainder of this program, we will take individual questions from the audience about the 50th ALC and current critical issues facing the Black community. If you'll remember, when you registered, you were invited to submit questions for this opening session. This morning, we'll dive into those. I will facilitate this morning's Q&A session to ensure the conversation remains within conference guidelines and that we proceed in a timely manner. Let's get started. I'd like to pose the first question to you, Congresswoman Beatty. Ronald Johnson asks, what is on the top of the must achieve list for the upcoming legislative session? Thank, 
Ronald for that question. I'm very pleased to share with him and everyone listening that for us, passage of the voting rights legislation named after our beloved and former member, John Lewis. We also know as the nation watched what happened with George Floyd, the George Floyd Voting Rights Act police reform efforts, legislation to also address the wealth gap, our infrastructure legislation. And you're gonna hear more about that and see more about that in the coming week. We know far too many people died because of COVID-19. So that has gone to the top of our list. We actually went live with all of the members of the Congressional Black Caucus not only sharing their stories, but actually getting vaccinated live and on camera. The debt ceiling is so important to us, to our children, grandchildren, and those yet unborn. And we cannot be members of Congress and proceed if we don't pass a fiscal year 2022 budget that reflects the priorities, not only of the CBC, but of the Biden-Harris administration. So let me end by saying we have public works. We want to make sure that we protect our environment and that we stand up and fight for all of those struggling families, those who are unemployed, those who are matriculating in college. So we are investing in a stronger economy with our highways, with our health care, and also reducing poverty. And we are doing this through having domestic policy council committees where all of our CBC members are, are participating. And also we have the public who has been engaged with us. Now I know that was a lot and we have a lot on our schedule, but we want everybody to know our agenda is really reflective of our power and our message. And that's the CBC and black excellence. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. Chair Billingsley, what additional items are at the forefront for you? Sure. One of the biggest goals during this year's conference is to create engaging discourse about today's issues from an African-American perspective. Thought leaders, legislators, and concerned citizens will engage on economic development, civil and social justice, public health, and education issues. Our theme is infused into our conference programming and it reflects our charge for 2021 and beyond through a continued commitment to uplifting, empowering and mobilizing black communities. This year we celebrate 50 years of the Congressional Black Caucus's commitment to excellence through engagement, equity and empowerment. So we invite you all to tune in. Thank you so much. Congresswoman Blunt Rochester, Julian Jackson posed that, we have lost many lives during this pandemic. How best can we move forward and give our people hope for the next generation? What is the collective strategy of the CDC to move forward from the coronavirus pandemic? Well, first of all, Julian, thank you for that question. I think there is not a member of the CDC, just like there is not a constituent that we have that has not been touched by this pandemic. And we send our prayers to all of those individuals who have lost loved ones, um, who have perished, or who have contracted COVID-19. But we know at the CBC that faith without works is dead. And so we are laser focused on two areas, recovery and rebuilding. From recovery, I can tell you from the very beginning of this pandemic, we knew that as, as, as black and brown folks, health disparities already existed, inequities in healthcare already existed, but what the pandemic was did was push it to the forefront. And so first we pushed for real data collection to show that we were the ones that were disproportionately being impacted. Secondly, we pushed that in any legislation, our communities were targeted with the resources and that it was equitable, not equal, equitable. And that's from testing, to vaccines, to making sure those PPP loans were targeted. That was a big focus for us, making sure that as we recover mentally, economically, and physically, that we have the resources that we need and we continue to do that. That leads to rebuilding. Um, we, we hear President Biden from the state of Delaware talk about building back better 
That means with equity and with justice. And that includes ensuring that we have access to broadband and internet to be able to deal with the digital divide because we know that this pandemic showed us if you, to, in order to work, in order to, to socialize, in order to go to school, it was important whether you were rural, urban or suburban that you had access to broadband. So we fight for that at the Congressional Black Caucus. Healthcare, uh, making sure that you have access to healthcare and expanding it, that's something that we fight for. And then I will also just mention, as we build back better and have an infrastructure package, we want to make sure that every community gets its fair share. That's important to us, that you have the resources that you need, but that you also get access, whether you are a small business or whether you're a contractor, we want to make sure that there is equity. So part of this, that recover, rebuild, leads to restoration. And that's our goal, to restore and to uplift. Thank you, Congresswoman. That brings us to our next question. Congressman Brown, Sia Barbara Kamara asks, what is the Congressional Black Caucus doing to ensure equitable distribution of coronavirus vaccines to African countries? Fantastic question and thank you for asking that. Look, it's an imperative. It's a moral, economic, social, political, and cultural imperative that the United States commit to vaccinating the entire world this year. Not or not just as an act of charity, but as an act of self-interest and leadership. And that we begin by delivering vaccines to those nations that have the greatest need and the least ability, resources, innovation, or infrastructure to develop the vaccine. The longer it takes, and that's Africa, the longer it takes to reach herd immunity on a global scale, the longer we'll be required to live with travel restrictions and vaccine passports, not to speak of face masks and quarantines, the longer the wait, the more two-tiered the world continues to be. Also, the larger the pockets of the world in which the virus continues to circulate, the greater the potential for new strains, possibly including strains resistant to the vaccines now available. So that's why on August 25th, just last month, the CBC, led by Barbara Lee and Karen Bass, sent a letter to President Biden urging him to donate 100 million vaccines to Africa above current donation levels. The international community has rightly criticized the United States and other Western countries for pushing towards booster shots for our citizens while not donating additional vaccines to places like Africa, where the vaccination rate is only around 3%. The World Health Organization has taken the position that additional doses need to be shared in order to reach the goal of vaccinating 70% of the world's population. While the vaccination rate recently has tripled in Africa generally, their supply of vaccines is dwindling. So the CBC is pushing for prompt action now. Thank you, Congressman. Chair Billingsley, this one is for you. Layla Waddell is wondering about C CBCF's resources and asks, how do students get involved with CBCF? Well, thank you so much for that question and I'm happy to give an answer to it. So our goal is to increase the pool of black leaders in public service careers and public policy positions. We do this through our Leadership Institute, which provides fellowships, internships and scholarships to deserving students nationwide. Our Leadership Institute offers numerous educational and leadership development programs for individuals ranging from college students to young professionals with graduate degrees. Our programs prepare them to become principled leaders, skilled policy analysts, and informed advocates by exposing them to the processes that develop national policies and implement them from Capitol Hill to federal field offices. The best way to get involved is to explore our opportunities and apply to the Leadership Institute by visiting cbcfinc.org. That's cbcfinc.org. Fantastic. Thank you. Congresswoman Beatty, Deborah Coleman wants to know, what is CBC's strategy to avert voter suppression? 
Well, again, let me just say thank you for that question. This is at the top of our list because I don't need to remind uh, the audience uh, or any of us what we went through with the devastating last four years as it related to voter suppression, as it related to actually denying the right that an election was won by our current president. So we're out in the forefront. We're actually in committee work week right now. You'll notice we're all in our districts and we're working with people like our caller, reminding them of the importance of one being registered to vote and two voting. Every vote counts. John Lewis reminded us that it is one of the most precious things that we have and the power of our vote. So we are mobilizing our communities. Look at how successful we were in Atlanta, Georgia. It was the power of the people. And it was also led by people who look like me, but more importantly, the Congressional Black Caucus, because we know what we have to lose. We know what the consequences are. So we are sharing our stories. We're sharing our successes because we are in the majority because people galvanized, mobilized, and got involved and got engaged. And that is the power we have. So our whole strategy is a strategy of people protecting the vote, speaking out against voter suppression, voter purging. We have been very successful across many of our districts simply because we've galvanized people, we've spoken out, and that's why we've had the victories. And don't forget, the Congressional Black Caucus represents 17 million Black Americans and 78 Americans. That's a lot of power. And so we have a strong message of get out the vote. Thank you so much. Congressman Blunt Rochester, Joseph Holtzclaw posed that many efforts have been made to uplift the black community by overcoming barriers to higher education, subsidized grants and scholarships, affirmative actions by universities and colleges and other resources to prepare and support those to be successful. What more can be done and specifically how can we improve foundational learning in inner city and rural public schools to better prepare our students for the next level of learning and development? That is a phenomenal question and it really gets at the root of so many things, whether it's healthcare, whether it's our, our economic upliftment. Um, and I want to start off by, I, I have to sort of go back to, our, to Joyce Beatty because our chairwoman talked about the mobilization of so many others, but she herself put her own self on the line, got arrested, said these issues are so vital and so important that every single one of us has to take a stand in this moment. And so that really does lead to why the vote is tied to everything. And it's tied to education as well. We have at the CBC an education and labor task force, which is committed to fulfilling the promise of Brown versus Board of Ed. And we think about the fact that we've got to start even before, before a kid is in school all the way to issues of maternal mortality, which we are laser focused on and are about to submit more legislation um, that hopefully will get passed in this budget. We've got a real focus on making sure that kids start out healthy and well in the beginning. We also have an investment in childcare because too many times it's black and brown women that, that are the ones that are actually in need of childcare or our child care workers, and we want to make sure that we support and uplift so that we start out strong. As it pertains to higher education, through the leadership of Alma Adams and others in the CBC, we have been able to make major investments in our HBCUs and minority serving institutions. And we believe that we got to put our money where our mouth is. We got to make sure that those investments go to scholarships, grants, but also the infrastructure of those facilities as well, because we know that they are more in need. We at the CBC are very much focused on this. And it also gets to my last answer about ensuring that we bridge that digital divide, because we know that that also is a piece of it. I'll lastly say that um, I started a Future of Work Caucus in Congress, because again, we don't want to be left behind. And we know that education is the key. 
So everything from the, the, the Jobs Act, which is a Stephen Horsford bill that allows for uh, us to have short-term Pell Grants uh, to our investments in colleges and in programs, apprenticeship programs, will help us to move forward in education. We at the CBC and the Education Labor Task Force is working on that daily and has a plan to move us forward. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. Congressman Brown, Leonard Robinson wants to know, how do we build sustainability in underserved communities? And there's a, there's a lot that needs to be done to build sustainability in underserved communities. For generations, we have seen entrenched, uh, almost intractable disparities in our economy and our society. Uh, that have made it harder for underserved communities to get a fair shot at the blessings, the benefits, the opportunities uh, that this nation uh, holds. Uh, the consequences of decades of disinvestment in America's infrastructure have fallen most heavily on the black community and other communities of color, while the impacts of pollution and the climate crisis disproportionately threaten the lives and livelihoods of black and brown people. So it's time now, it's long overdue that we make investments that tackle systemic racism and rebuild our economy and our social safety net so that every person in America can reach their full potential. Addressing these threats are at the cornerstone of the Biden-Harris administration's jobs plan. The, the infrastructure and the families plan, which is fully supported by the Congressional Black Caucus. Uh, this plan that we fully embrace, and I'm on the transportation infrastructure where I serve with Colin Allred, Eddie Bernice Johnson, Hank Johnson, uh, Eleanor Holmes, uh, Norton, Frederica uh, Wilson, all of us working together and with our colleagues to make sure we're doing a number of things, targeting workforce development opportunities in underserved communities with a focus on jobs in the technologies of the future, uh, bridging the digital divide, as Lisa mentioned, uh, by achieving 100% coverage of high-speed broadband, eliminating racial and gender inequities in research and development and in STEM education, helping black and brown owned small businesses access capital and scale through over $30 billion of investments. Uh, we're also committed to delivering 40% of the benefits of climate and infrastructure investments in underserved communities, investing in clean energy to advance climate justice and mitigate the disparate impacts of pollution on communities of color. And we need to build a more equitable transportation infrastructure and public systems by making historic investments in addressing particularly the residential segregation that we have seen in black communities caused by decades of discriminatory federal infrastructure investment. So these are some of the things that we are focusing on as a caucus and using our positions, whether it's on transportation infrastructure committee, whether it's on energy and commerce or ways and means or the host of other committees where we are holding leadership positions to make sure that the investments we make in our country lead to sustainability in underserved communities. Fantastic, thank you, sir. Ms. Vizi, I'm excited to say that we have a question from a former intern. Nicholas French asks, as a former CBCF intern, how can I use my experience with the foundation to further propel me toward a career in government? Um, because our emerging leaders learn the inner workings of the federal government. As a CBC alumni, they, are, they often explore positions in public service or public policy careers. And our alumni go on in careers that are amazing. Um, so a couple of things. First of all, I think it's very important if you are an alumni of the CBCF, we wanna hear from you. We want to make sure that we stay connected with you. There are lots of networking opportunities. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we're here to help you 
advance in your career as well. Um, but again, we, we, we can't do that if we don't hear from you. So please contact us at CBCF um, email or call us and, and we would love to help you navigate this career. Great information. Thank you, Ms. Vizi. Moving on, Chairwoman Beatty. Sonia Smith submitted the following. Access to capital and driving generational wealth continue to be longstanding topics across the minority community. What tangible and creative legislative actions are being discussed to deal with these gaps, issues, and prevalent realities for so many of us? First, uh, again, we certainly appreciate uh, all of the questions. And when we think and talk about closing the racial wealth gap, that's one of the most critical issues that we face as a nation and as a people. It has been a priority for the Congressional Black Caucus and for me and our co-chairs. Congressman Brown talked about it as he talked about infrastructure and rebuilding uh, our economy. Some of the things we're talking about and we're working on to give you some tangible uh, information or tangible actions, we have a very powerful financial services committee chaired by a black woman, member of the CBC, Congresswoman Maxine Waters. And she has also established a diversity and inclusion committee that specifically looks at access to capital, having hearings, bringing in experts to talk about how we challenge major uh, majority uh, companies, not just for jobs anymore, but looking at who they're hiring as asset managers, looking at brokers, looking at the CPAs and the lawyers, and also looking at who's in the C-suites, looking at who's on the boards. Are those individuals individuals who are reflective of our minority population? How many Black folks do they have engaged in the decision-making? Efforts to expand DNI and equity. It's not just about bringing someone on, it's about the equity that we have also. And one of the things according to Prosperity Now, the racial wealth gap is so wide that it will take us 228 years to be able to have Black American families to amass the average amount of wealth of a majority white family. Additional research also has concluded that the real gross domestic product or the GDP could be four to six percent higher if the wealth gap is closed. So I think we have enough ammunition through our research. We also have not bragged enough about the research through Tanya VC and her team that they do on giving us information. We also have corporate leaders, thanks to Lori Billingsley, our chair. This is in the forefront at every level. When we look at sponsorships, when we look at who we're working with, it's more than that. We look at who they are doing business with. And I think that the needle is moving. Is it moving fast enough or far enough? No, but we actually have a plan of action. The last thing I wanna say that I think is very important to this, we actually brought in, through the leadership of the Congressional Black Caucus, the top financial institutions with 50 billion or more, and we directly made them respond to that very question. How are you helping in your industry as we look at the disparities, as we look at how and what we're not doing for Black families and Black individuals? So we're making progress. Uh, but we still have a long way to go. But you can rest assured that the Congressional Black Caucus is out in the forefront and the changes that we're seeing, I can clearly tell you there's a footprint and a fingerprint of a CBC member. Awesome, that's so inspiring. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. Congressman Brown, can you address Deborah Keelan's question of what is being done to implement STEM for children of color? Sure, and thanks, Deborah, for the uh, question. I, I like that, uh, Joyce, a footprint and a fingerprint, because we are all over the place and we're working on just a host of uh, issues and preparing uh, our children uh, to be STEM ready, uh, to get that STEM education uh, is a top priority for so many members 
of the Congressional Black Caucus. A recent uh, study found that a quarter of U.S. high schools uh, with the highest percentage of Black and Latinx students didn't offer Algebra two, And that's a, that's a prerequisite for many higher level STEM courses. And uh, without that, it can be a key barrier to college graduation for many Americans. Uh, we also noticed that in many of those same high schools, they don't even offer uh, a, a course uh, in basic chemistry. Black students are often denied access to limited seats in advanced courses, particularly in racially diverse schools where they aren't the majority. Uh, STEM curricula and materials, uh, they prioritize the stories of STEM contributions made by white men uh, and minimize, omit, or perpetuate harmful stereotypes about the knowledge and history of STEM leaders of color. And more than half of the school districts in the United States uh, and more than 90% of districts primarily serving black and brown students reported difficulties recruiting and retaining certified knowledgeable STEM teachers. So as a nation, we have to do a lot more. We are failing in terms of encouraging students of color to seek quality STEM education. So there are several efforts uh, that we need to undertake and we are working on uh, through our members uh, in order to make sure that more students of color have STEM opportunities. First, uh, we need to ensure uh, high school STEM coursework is relevant mm -hmm. and applicable to a 21st century context. STEM education needs to engage and excite students. And you can do that through hands-on or project-based learning that connects to personal lived experiences and relevant career op uh, options. Number two, we need to support more teachers to facilitate active and applied STEM learning. And you do that by infusing more STEM knowledge and capacity in the courses that teach teachers to deliver STEM education. So you do that in teacher preparation and you do it in a way that's personally relevant and it's career connected, especially to students of color. And that includes attracting and retaining more people of color into the STEM teaching profession. And third, we have to create systems that ensure equitable STEM teaching and learning. So while some students may go on to a four or four plus more years of academic higher education, many students will go directly into the workforce with or without an apprenticeship program. So we need to ensure that whatever tracking policies are in place, uh, that the separation between career and technical education and advanced STEM courses doesn't prevent students of color from accessing and thriving in relevant career-ready STEM experiences. Students have to be able to move between pathways as they move through their middle and high school programs. And I know that Representatives uh, uh, Johnson, Eddie Johnson of Texas and uh, Representative Bowman of New York, they've introduced several bills in those areas to support those efforts. Uh, Alma Adams uh, leads our HBCU caucus uh, I've been working with her and as have other members of the Congressional Black Caucus to make sure that we are investing more in STEM education at the post-secondary uh, level. Uh, I've been working with the Department of Defense to increase the number of research dollars that go to historically black colleges and universities and minority serving institutions to increase those investments in basic science, applied science, and in, in preparing more and more uh, graduates of color uh, to enter those STEM fields and STEM educators so that we can train and develop that next generation of STEM leaders. Those are some of the things uh, that we're working on that we think we need to do to deliver more STEM education to students of color. Amazing. Thank you, Congressman. Ms. Beasy, can you close us out with addressing Suzanne Mayo's question? She would like to know, how can former CBCF staff members former Congressional Black Associates and former CBCF staff be involved in ALC in future years? What a great question. Um, while you may no longer be directly connected with the CBC or the CBCF, please know you are always still a part of the family. Uh, you can continue to be involved in the future of our annual legislative conference by volunteering. Volunteers are 
critical to the success of the CPCF programs and events. Um, we offer several volunteer opportunities for you to engage in a productive and a collaborative and a fun and loving volunteering environment. So to learn more about how you can volunteer, not only doing ALC, but throughout the year, visit our website at cbcfinc.org. Secondly, um, the most important help is to continue to just continue to support the mission of advancing the global black community by developing leaders and informing policy and educating the public. And so there's many ways that you can continue to not only support our annual legislative conference, but to continue to support the mission and the purpose of the foundation. For more information, again, just visit our website at cbcfinc.org. Thank you, Tori. Thank you so much, Ms. VZ. And thank you all so much for this rich and insightful discussion. That concludes our Q&A and our opening session. Thank you all to who submitted questions for our panel, um, to our panel, and we encourage everyone to stay engaged in the conversation throughout the week. Be sure to check out our in-platform networking tools and use hashtag ALC50 on social media. Up next, stay tuned for our Leadership Institute showcase, hear about the powerful work our CBCF interns and fellows are doing. Also later today, don't miss our session discussing the 2021 issue of the journal for policy analysis and research where journal authors and editors will share insights on issues across the black diaspora. To wrap up the first day of ALC 50, be sure to tune in tonight on this virtual platform at 6 p.m. Eastern for our star-studded inspirational day of healing program, formerly known as the Prayer Breakfast. Thank you again to this morning's sponsor, FedEx, this outstanding panel for engaging with our audience members and sharing your thoughtful perspectives, and to all of you for attending our opening session. We at the CBCF wish you an enjoyable and educational week as we all press onward in power. Thank you and have a great day.